As it stands, the Minnesota Vikings are in line to get two third round compensatory picks. Here's how they can ruin it. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to those of you who listen to this show every single day. My hashtag everydayers, I love you all so very much. I appreciate you all so very much. Boy, do I appreciate the amount of questions that I got. I got like 100. I think I'm going to get to like 20 of them. So I, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Hopefully I get somewhere close. But today is Twitter Tuesday. And thank you all so much to those of you who listen all the time. If you are new here, Tuesdays are when we answer questions from the listeners. So sit down and get comfy. Please enjoy. You can, of course, find the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, uh, whether it is a, a podcast listening app like Sirius XM, uh, where you can also find live broadcasts of uh, hometown broadcasts of sports games. Just search out like Timberwolves or whatever. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for 20 bucks off of your first purchase. So it is Twitter Tuesday. If you ever have a question for me, you can send it to me whenever uh, at Luke Braun NFL or at Locked On Vikings on Twitter. You can also fill out the Google form in the show notes, which I recommend you do, because if you like DM it to me, I'll see it. Maybe I'll answer it on the spot or I might just forget about it. <laughs> I might even forget to check on Tuesdays. That happens. Uh, so if you have questions, send them to me the Google form in the show notes or send me an email at Locked On Vikings podcast at gmail.com. So, first one I'm going to answer comes from Skull Fan, who asks, how the frick do compensatory picks work? It gets confusing with the cancellations and what players cancel out others. People are saying, with the KJ contract in New England, we are now in line for two 2025 third rounders. How does the math on that work out? So, uh, the compensatory formula, like the order of operations is important. So, here's how they figure it out, right? First off, you got to figure out who is or isn't a compensatory free agent, aka who counts towards the towards compensatory picks and and free agents that count and don't count the difference is if they played out their whole contract or if they got cut early if they get cut early they don't count alexander madison does not count for the vikings he got cut early uh kirk cousins does count even though there's void years and stuff you can kind of um th ignore the void years to a point and just say like did he play out the amount of years the vikings said that he was going to play out so for kirk cousins and daniel hunter the answer to that is yes so once you've figured out who all the compensatory free agents are you rank them based on a number of factors this part's very proprietary and nobody really knows exactly how it works but nick corty at uh, over the cap has it down pretty close um that's going to have to do with stuff like the contract size, how much time they play, postseason accolades can get there. If somebody makes the Pro Bowl, that can that can matter. Stuff like that will um, sort of shift the formula uh, around. But the biggest one is going to be how much money that guy makes. So if they make a certain amount, they count. And there is a cap of 32. The, the league can only award 32 compensatory picks in a given year uh, for these so... If you're not in the top 32 contracts, basically, you're probably not going to count for a pick. For example, Troy Dye, right? Or uh, Josh Dobbs, right? Joshua Dobbs signs with the San Francisco 49ers. He makes $2.25 million on a one-year deal. That's not enough to crack the top 32. So he's not going to get the Vikings a comp pick, even though he his his contract expired and he counts toward the compensatory formula. So once you have your like top 32 and, you, and they're all ranked, Another part of that formula is determining which round of compensatory pick that counts for. So Kirk Cousins and Daniil Hunter, pretty big contracts, they get you a third round pick. Somebody like uh, like Jordan Hicks, who signs just a $4 million deal over in Cleveland, gets a sixth round pick, uh, or at least according to Nick Corti's uh, projection, which all of this is guessing right now, by the way. But there, he's a pretty good guesser, so you can. T it's probably not going to change much, if at all. So the Vikings have lost six compensatory free agents. They are Kirk Cousins, Daniil Hunter, DJ Wanham, Marcus Davenport, Jordan Hicks, and now KJ Osborne. There are guys like Troy Dye and Austin Schlotman and Josh Dobbs that probably won't count because they won't make enough money. Uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of other players like Alexander Madison that don't count at all because they were cut. 
So those are the six loss, and the Vikings signed four in Blake Cashman, Jonathan Grenard, Andrew Van Ginkle, and Sam Darnold. Um, from there, so you've lost six and you've gained four, which means you are now owed two compensatory picks, and all uh, 10 of those players are in that top 32. Their, their contracts are big enough to be in that top 32. So now you have you have to figure out which two the Vikings get. And this is where things start canceling each other out. Best you can, like cancels like. So for example, the, the Vikings uh, departing free agents, Wanham, Davenport, Hicks, Osborne, are all sixth and seventh round picks. So they're going to cancel out the sixth round pick size that is Blake Cashman, the fifth round pick that is Sam Darnold, and etc. They will not necessarily, like the Blake Cashman contract which is projected as a sixth rounder, will cancel out another sixth rounder. It won't cancel out the third rounder that is Kirk Cousins. Now, if the Vikings went out and signed a big giant free agent for whatever, somehow they go pay somebody $30 million, that would cancel out uh, Kirk Cousins. But, you know, signing Andrew Van Ginkle, not so much. That's more or less how it works. Uh, you can, of course, trade those once they are actually awarded. They'll be awarded, like, officially kind of around the beginning of free agency each year. So the, Vi the, the, the 2024 comp picks were already announced. Vikings didn't get any. Um, but they are currently in line for three or for two third rounders in 2025, which helps a lot when you're trying to potentially use future capital to trade up. Now, I don't think that they can trade those comp picks before they have them, right? Uh, they only have one third rounder right now. So they can trade that, though, and feel pretty good, or maybe even fourth rounders and stuff next year as like pot sweeteners, and feel pretty good that they're going to get two third rounders later, as long as they don't mess it up by signing somebody else later, right? Uh, the other ways that this can get messed up, if somebody gets hurt, that that pick can get like demoted, basically. Uh, this happened with Trey Waynes a few years ago. The Vikings were in line for a third round pick. He hurts his peck. He doesn't play. It goes down to a fourth round pick. It didn't. It doesn't leave entirely, but it did get demoted for that. So playtime matters. Stuff can happen where more guys make the Pro Bowl than you think, and KJ Osborne gets kicked out of the formula, and then you know, then that that uh, all cancels out. So once you've done all the canceling, like other contracts can kind of make it <laughs> because some contracts have like canceled each other out and stuff. Uh, and so that's how you kind of get to the 32, and you get pretty small contracts. For example, like uh, Yash Nyman, four million dollar contract that gives the Packers a seventh round pick. That's what they're in uh in line for him all that kind of stuff can s will will sort of work itself out um the next question comes from max who asks is there a cutoff date for the comp pick calculation like is it finalized after the draft or we'll have to wonder all year whether the vikings lost a third rounder because they signed a fourth string cornerback in training camp yeah so the next thing that happens is the draft that is the cutoff so yes there is a cutoff it's the draft and and for that reason certain free agents who are compensatory free agents i'm looking at like dalton reisner might not sign who by the way i don't think quasi going to sign him back he went on nine to noon with paul allen and basically said like yeah we're looking to get like the best players possible when asked if he was trying to to re-sign dalton reisner which to me implies that they do not see dalton reisner as the best option out there at guard for them right now if they're even going to sign another guard so they're they're i don't think that they're going to bring him back so wherever he goes if he signs tomorrow it counts toward the compensatory formula it actually puts the vikings in line for another pick but uh, assuming he makes enough money, which I think he will. But if he signs after the draft, it's all locked away and nothing counts toward the comp formula anymore. It's all totally locked up. So you will kind of see this second wave of free agency after the draft. That is, you know, all these guys that were maybe worth signing, but not worth ruining your comp formula over. And one of the advantages of being a team that maybe doesn't care about the comp formula is that you can go out and sign Dalton Reisner right now with no competition uh, and maybe get more free agents that way, if, you, if that's the way that you want to play it. There's always pros and cons. Steven asks, uh, why don't the Vikings try to pull more cap into this year? Would they Could they re-sign JJ and others and front load the contract since the Super Bowl window could be two to three years from now, like a reverse signing bonus? Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of people see this as like, when's your window? When isn't your window? You know, let's just like pick one year and only compete in that one. Um, the thing is, because the cap goes, uh, is going to go up so dramatically, whether or not you're in a window, it's still probably more efficient to, to like scale those contracts accordingly. Um, it, it's just going to be easier in two years 
to pay twenty million dollars of a of a signing bonus or whatever than it is to try to pay twenty million dollars right now up front and have it off your books. Um just by percentages and stuff, it's just gonna be like easier to deal with. And not so much that you backload everything and you and you you overuse that power, right? But typically these contracts will just scale uh with the increasing cap in in some way and and hopefully what you might have is that they scale, but they don't quite scale as much as they have to to fully keep up. And then in a way, you're front loading without actually front loading. And I think that's a lot of what uh, Rob Brzezinski does is, is it will scale, it will backload, but it will be a lesser percentage of cap every year. And like that's the way you can kind of say that they're actually front loading. But if you front load the actual dollar amount, that's actually a mega extreme front load and you just you just don't have to go that hard at it. Um, I have a whole, oh my God, I have so many more questions. So I'm going to try to get to as many of these as possible. If I don't get to yours, I apologize, but we're going to speed it up coming up. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Game Time. It is the best place to find last minute tickets to anything, whether it's a basketball game or a hockey game, uh, maybe a college basketball game. If you live near where they're playing any of the tournaments, you could go get last minute tickets to that right now. Now on the Game Time app, they have deals on tickets right up to the start of an event, even an hour into the event. And you best believe by then someone's just trying to get rid of their tickets. That's how you're going to find a deal. So you can find exclusive exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals for tickets for anything, including sports games, but also comedy theater, all kinds of more stuff. And game, the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty bucks off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks again for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. When you're done here, okay. So the MLB is doing their ultimate season preview, and you know when the, when Locked On does an ultimate thing, you have to tune in. So March 20th, they will have the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports today. March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, a live show where you will get the local insight from MLB experts, including Brandon Warren, who does Locked On Twins. Find it on March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern time on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or for free on the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Let's move on with this Twitter Tuesday episode to a question from Jesse Smith, who is a man after own, my own heart, because he says, why do these DTs seem so small? Where are the big boys at? True. What a great point. The Vikings have signed a few defensive linemen. Uh, of course, we, we talked a little bit about Jerry Tillery, and he doesn't really move the needle for me. He's very much... I, I, however you felt about Dean Lowry, feel the same about Jerry Tillery. I think he's about the same player, and unfortunately, I think he's going to have about the same role, and I, I don't really love that. I think that's probably too much to ask of him, but maybe I'll be wrong, because they still are signing defensive line. They've now signed Jonah Williams. No, not that Jonah Williams. Another one who actually started most of the season for the Los Angeles Rams uh, as a sort of five technique, you know, defensive end, defensive tackle hybrid, very much the same position as Jerry Tillery, maybe even competing with each other for a roster spot, but at the very least competing with each other for snaps. But regardless, the Vikings still only have two, count them, two defensive players over 300 pounds on their entire roster, and that's Harrison Phillips and Jaquel and Roy. Uh, they had three last year, so I do still think that a big, big boy is coming. Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe that comes in the draft, right? Like that could be a sixth rounder. That's just like big, but not very good or something like that, or from a small school or something. Uh, or, or maybe there is another big signing coming down the pipe. I don't think somebody asked if there's defensive tackles available in free agency that you can be excited about. I think the the pickings are pretty slim by now. Uh, but there could be a name that I'm forgetting, or there could be a name that they're more excited about that I just am unfamiliar with because they played for the Jets that I don't cover or whatever. Uh, that happens to be a lot in free agency. So whoever does join, we'll be sure to get to know them plenty well. Get Quacken asks, what do you think of Dan Feeney's hair? <laughs> Dan Feeney is the other guy. So he signed over the weekend. And boy, did I just forget to talk about him because he signed like the same day the Vikings did the draft trade. And I was doing a whole thing with Locked On Texans there. 
You may remember him from the 2017 draft as somebody who was sort of debated over whether he was better than like Pat Elfline and Ethan Posick and Forrest Lamp and all those guards around that time. I think he ended up kind of consensus second in that class, but he didn't go second. He had a concussion issue coming out of college, so that like sunk his draft stock, and we all thought that was the only reason. And if he can stay healthy, he'd be so good, but he really wasn't in Los Angeles um, for, for the Chargers, and then he's sort of bounced around from there most recently with the Bears. Now he's rocking a pretty sick mullet so that rocks yeah man i think it rocks uh god bless america james kunow asks how come whenever a team misses on a draft pick fans only blame the gm could there also exist a possibility that either coaching or the player themselves don't support them enough to reach their full potential true very good point james kunow and then he went on to make a point about like kyle hamilton maybe wouldn't have been good here if he didn't like if he had to you know switch defensive coordinators or something like that which uh, that chases the rabbit a little bit more than than i think we need to but i think overall yes that's a very good point when a draft pick does not work out there are a lot of reasons why that can happen i think we too often um, employ like a madden logic where these guys are actually just face down like player cards and we just, we flip them up and see what we got right and maybe you can you know do do enough of your like swami thing to to see what's under the card you know see if you can see through it like superman uh see through walls style but really these are people and they're usually people with something you got to teach them um very rarely do you see a player come out of college with nothing to learn right uh <laughs> sauce gardener that's the only one i can think of in recent memory so, yeah, you can absolutely take a risk on a player that needs to learn a lot. And then for whatever reason, that player doesn't learn a lot and it doesn't work out. And I think it's important to look at why a bust happened rather than just complaining that a bust happened and saying, gosh, the GM must be really bad. You want to look at like Lewis scene. Why did that go south? Was everyone just really wrong? Was he always just secretly bad and only you, very smart person, knew it? And if, if you did hate him ahead of time, then you can take your victory lap, right? Um, but I also still would encourage you, okay, why didn't you like him? Is that what came to fruition? Uh, or did he get hurt week four of his rookie year and then have to like learn a new defense again? And now, you know, things are just totally stunted and now everything's going to be way behind where it's supposed to be. It's actually pretty understandable. And I know people are, are not very good at like listening to excuse making, but excuses still like make sense. Like they're, they still logically follow, you know? Uh, you just have to make sure that they're valid and that it's not just cope. And that's the argument, right? But yeah, I think that's that's important. W what I will say too is, you know, sometimes, yeah, it is that just the coach just failed them. Uh, I, I was talking to somebody who's been in the league for a long time um, who was like, yeah, coaches think that they like know everything and then, and then a player will come in and they'll get overcoached and they'll totally get their game wrecked and they'll be a shell of who they were in college. Like that happens all the time. Uh, I mean, this guy's seen it year, year in and year out. And I think the true skill is in being able to diagnose that. I think it's really easy to just say, gosh, bad GM did bad draft picks. That's the easy way. I think the truly skillful way is the one who can identify why that happened and figure out how you would like prevent that kind of thing from happening in the future. And I think that's that's the kind of person that a team would actually want to hire is some, somebody with that skill set. Nolan M says the three linebackers signed seem to be on the lighter side. Do you think we need to add some bulk on defense? Cashman doesn't seem to be a one-to-one -one replacement for Hicks. Um, yeah, so what's interesting here is, at least in terms of their listed weight, Blake Cashman, 6'1", 235. Jordan Hicks, 6'1", 236. They're basically the same size. But your instinct here is picking up on something else. It's not just height and weight listed that make a difference here. It's physicality. It's how do you hold up when you're when a guard is coming at you? And I think Hicks is definitely better at that than, than Cashman. So yeah, a little bit of, of oomph in the second level would be kind of nice. Uh, the Vikings have gone about solving that in the past, uh, and Flores did in the past by just having more D-line on the field. This is kind of what Dean Lowry was for. It would be like, okay, instead of Ivan Pace, let's put Dean Lowry on there. We still have a little bit of speed and quickness. We can do stunts, but you know, at least he, he's, pr he can like line up against a guard and hopefully hold his spot and didn't, I don't think he got enough out of that in the, in the past. Um, and, and <laughs> Jerry Tillery is definitely not known for that, but, uh, that's at least the logic, right? At least that's like the thesis coming in. Um, okay, whole bunch more questions. There's a bunch of questions about the draft trade, so I want to make sure that I get to those in particular. That'll come up next. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your treatment thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply and for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. A 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Moving on here with this episode of Twitter Tuesday on the Lockdown Vikings podcast, let's talk about that draft trade the Vikings made with the Houston Texans last weekend. First question about it comes from Joe Talent, who says, I am stoked about getting two first round picks. We're short on talent and long on projects, but though I've been happy about Quasi during his free agency, him trading both QBs, both for a QB scares me. I'd rather have two possible wins as opposed to one possible win. So the answer to this, I mean, it's more of a concern than a question, but the, but the response to this is going to be the same response as it is for a lot of these. And it's that quarterback totally changes that math. The idea of, you know, having two things is better than having one thing is, is a pretty good logic. You get to diversify. If one of them busts, the other one can still hit and you still get a player, right? Um, versus putting all your eggs in one basket. And the fact that draft positions kind of overrated the guy at 22 might be Justin Jefferson. And if you trade up so that you can get the Jerry Judy, you might be paying for a worse. You have every probability in the world to be playing for a worse player. Like that's absolutely an outcome that is possible. Even if, you know, the 10th pick on average works out more than the 22nd pick. And it's like a, a, a better bet. You're still paying for a, a range of outcomes and you have to respect that. Totally get it. But when it comes to quarterback, all of that logic completely breaks down because quarterback is so much more valuable. Let me put it this way. I have this candle. If you're watching, I have a little candle that I got at Target. I think it was like $17. If I have two of those candles, then I have $34 worth of stuff. But if I have one iPhone, this is an iPhone 12, I think <laughs> it's worth like $600, right? So I have one thing that's an iPhone or I have two things that are candles I should probably go with the iPhone. That's going to be the more valuable thing, even though it's only one thing, right? And that's the way that quarterback just blows everything out. You would need quite a few candles to equal the value of an iPhone, right? Jordan Barrett asks, you said that Houston netted a third in trade value. I thought future picks were devalued by a round. And I thought you would actually have the Vikings ahead of an expected value if future picks were devalued by about 50%. Can you explain what charts and how trades work involving future picks? Okay, so this is, I think, a disparity born of the like trade calculator apparatus, which was first developed, I think, on Ben Baldwin's website. And, I, and it's hosted elsewhere now. But basically, yeah, rule of thumb is if you have a second next year is worth a third this year, right? So the Vikings basically gave up a second and a third to move up to one. Um, and most of the trade charts don't love that. But if you say that a pick next year is worth half of what it is worth, like half of its, its value this year, um, yeah, you might get a different answer. So it, depending on how much you devalue picks next year, which is a very debatable thing, um, you can argue that the Vikings came out ahead. What I will not abide, though, is a whole bunch of people in the YouTube comments saying that I just got the chart wrong. No, <laughs> here's a screenshot. <laughs> this is what the chart says. I left it on the default, which devalues future picks by 10%, which I believe is less than conventional wisdom, but is supported more by data than conventional wisdom is, which is just kind of like rooted in tradition. But data says that picks next year, moving them down around, I think it bears out that they're actually a little more valuable than that. So that's why like the nerd chart calculator is set to 10%. And I, I left it on the default. Uh, I kind of said, okay, I'll trust the nerds on that one. Skull Ross says, when would you expect a trade up to happen? Is there anything about the situation that would make you lean one way or the other towards a trade ahead of the draft or on draft day? So I think if you trade ahead of 
the draft, you are basically saying you know exactly what's going to happen before whatever pick that is, right? So if you're picking for, you know, you're trading for pick one, you can do that well ahead of the draft. It's not like anybody's going to snipe you, right? But if you're trading ahead for pick three, like San Francisco did a few years ago, it's because they knew that it was going to be Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson. Everybody knew that basically since the combine. Um, So if you're trading up to, say, three with New England, that's because you know it's going to be Caleb Williams and you know who Washington is taking and you're happy to get the third guy and you like the third guy enough that you can do that. So let's just get it out of out of the way. If let's say you like Drake May, but you don't like Jaden Daniels and you're worried that there's a, a chance that the commanders take Drake May and leave you with Jaden Daniels, you probably don't want to make that trade until you know that the commanders are not taking Drake May ar- away from you, right? So that's the logic there. Um, but for the Vikings, I think that they would be happy with either of those guys. So if they can get up to three, they would get up to three. The problem is I don't think New England wants to say yes to that. Because if they, unless they equally dislike Jaden Daniels and Drake May, and they just don't want a quarterback at all, which is not really what it sounds like coming out of Boston, um, then they are probably going to want to wait. If they really like one of those two guys or the other, they're going to want to wait and see what the commanders do. And if the commanders don't take their guy, they're going to say, yeah, we're staying put. But they're going to want to wait till they're on the clock. So I think it could be all the way till draft day. If they trade up to like, if the Vikings trade up to like five, then it kind of tells you that they feel like they have a really good sense for how the first four picks go and that they don't think any of those teams are going to trade down, right? If they trade to five, it kind of tells you they don't think Arizona will like trade down with Vegas and then they'll get leapfrogged for JJ McCarthy or whatever that they know. Okay. Arizona's taking Marvin Harrison. Okay. We can we know that they've told us that they know that that's what they want to do. And we know the three quarterbacks are going for top three picks. Um, but if there's any uncertainty, everybody's going to kind of wait till the last minute and get a, get give an opportunity for all the permutations to happen so you have more info. Grill asks, can you please expand on how trading up in parts could theoretically be cheaper than trading up in one big package? I don't know. It, like, in theory, it shouldn't be, right? If everybody adheres to all the same draft charts, it should all be like liquid, you know, moving up and down and stuff. But what it can do is help you preserve as many first round picks as you like want to maneuver it for, right? So let's say the Vikings trade up to five and let's say it takes two first round picks and a third round pick to do that. Well, if you hadn't made this trade with Houston, you'd be trading pick 11 and next year's first for a 2020 and, and, a, and a third round pick for pick five, right? But now you can do 11 and 23 for pick five and a third round pick uh, next year, probably. And you keep next year's first. Now, let's say you have a rookie quarterback and you have to start Sam Darnold for 10 games and you don't do so hot next year. That first might be pretty valuable and that's how you can try to eke value out of this. I think that's what Quasey's trying to do is he's he's trying to preserve his 2025 first round pick. Now, I, I think if you're going up to three, you probably have to give it up either way, but maybe that means you don't have to give up the 2026 first round pick and maybe the logic is the same there. Uh, all cash homie says, is there a world where we sit at 11 and draft whatever QB KOC feels worthy of that pick and then keep 23 and continue to build the roster? Maybe best DB, DB available or DT. Uh, I say definitely go get the QB, but what if? So a bunch of people asked a version of this question, and I don't think that it's an option for the Vikings. Not that I don't think it could be an option. Like I, 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 it has plenty of merit, and I think a lot of people want to like see the value of, well, what if we got like two defenders and really built the roster up? Um, I totally get it. I don't think the Vikings are considering it. That's maybe a better way to put it. I do not believe that this is something that that is on the Vikings radar. They are trading up. I'm basing that off of what was publicly reported at the combine. Some of what I heard from people that I know that were there. Uh, and then just like kind of the circumstantial evidence of the Vikings doing that Texans trade. You don't do that without a certain level of confidence in your ability to you to package that pick and and trade up. I, I just don't think so. And, and part of it, too, is that the combine scuttlebutt and all, all of the rumors right now are that QBs are going one, two, three, and then probably Marvin Harrison and then five. <laughs> like Top five picks are going to be four QBs. So picking at 11, you're talking about Michael Penix or Bo Nix. And I don't think that those guys are like franchise starting quarterbacks. I think those are day two flyer types. 
And, and, and it doesn't seem like the Vikings are doing that. They are. The, everybody knows that they're being crazy aggressive about it. They're not the kind of they're, they're not sitting back. You could argue for the merits of sitting back, but the Vikings ain't doing it. Gosh, I just didn't even get close to some questions. I got questions that have been sitting in this list for like three weeks, too. So I'm really sorry, but we will catch up to them because things will slow down soon enough. I will see you guys all tomorrow. And as always, skull.